Hello, Professor Fiore here, and in this video we are going to take a look at the non-inverting summing amplifier using an op-amp. Now you've probably already seen the video on the inverting summing amplifier. Very common. It has a nice characteristic in that right here, the virtual ground, is an ideal summing node. But this is a less than perfect summing amplifier. There are issues when we look at a large number of inputs. I'm only drawing two inputs here, but you know, you could certainly imagine cases, audio mixer, for example, where you would have 16, 24, you know, or more inputs. And one of the issues we have is the input impedance is set by this RI value for each channel, but all of those values in parallel help determine the noise gain of the amplifier. So if we have a large number of channels, the noise gain of the amplifier is going to be rather large, which does two things. It increases the noise, and number two, it narrows up the bandwidth of the amplifier. So, you know, not the best thing in the world. Is there another thing, another way we can approach this? And the answer is, yeah, we can do a non-inverting summing amplifier. So that looks like this, shown for three channels. Got the same kind of op amp. This is... Uh, a non-inverting series parallel sort of configuration. I just happen to have this set up for a gain of three. Um, but we see the three inputs. Like the other version, there are three input resistors, one for each. But the way it works is a bit different. It turns out that in this particular circuit, the noise gain is whatever the series parallel gain is. So in this particular circuit, it's going to be RF over RI plus one, which would be three. And you could have you know, 15 inputs out here, and as long as these resistors, uh, resistors are the same, you're going to get the same noise gain. So we don't necessarily have that narrowing of bandwidth that we would see in the inverting case. All right, how do we analyze this? It's not as simple as just, you know, saying, let me add up the three signals and multiply by three and off I go, or, you know, 10 inputs or whatever, heck, whatever the heck it happens to be. You might even be asking, why do I have these resistors? Well, the reason why we have these individual resistors is to isolate the inputs. If we didn't have them and we just tried to wire these things together, basically what would happen is the other inputs would short out any given input. So you have to have some kind of resistance here to isolate these. Let's take a look at this in terms of a um, sort of like a thevenizing uh, equivalent circuit where I'm only looking at one input, like V and 1. What do we see for that? Well, you would short out the other inputs. All right, so R2 over here is going to ground. R3 is going to ground. However many inputs we have, right, all these resistors, they're all going to go to ground. What does that do? Well, basically, that creates a little voltage divider. Here's your R1. Here's the R2 and R3 going to ground. So we can see, right, in this particular case, these two are going to be 5K in parallel. So we've got a divider between that 5K and this 10K, which means you're only going to get a third of the input, right? As a formula, V out is whatever the input is times the thing you're interested in, the R2 in parallel with R3, divided by the total, which would be R1 plus R2 in parallel with R3. Now we can generalize that. So let's say we have N channels and we make all the resistors the same size, right? That would be typical. You don't have to, but that would be typical. So we can simplify this or generalize this so that V out is some input, V in X, we'll call it, right? Times, same thing, the resistance you're interested in, which would be R divided by N minus one, right? Because if you, know, if you have five channels, there's only four resistors that would be out here. That's why it's N minus one. And that quantity is divided by R, right? This guy back here, essentially plus, again, R over N minus 1. Now, we normalize this for R being unity, and that formula turns into this, 1 over N minus 1 divided by 1 plus 1 over N minus 1. If you multiply through by N minus 1, you're going to get 1 over 1 plus uh, N minus 1, which is going to work out to N. All right, so... End result, the divider loss, in other words, V out over V in for any given channel, would be 1 over N. So if I have, in this case, three channels, 
it would be one third. So whatever I put in over here, I'm going to get one third of that out here. And that's going to be the same for all of the inputs, assuming we have all identical resistors. If I have 16 inputs, it's going to get divided by 16, you know, whatever it works out to. All right. Pretty simple setup in that regard. All right. So you would just come down here and you would add up all of those, you know, other input channels. And that's what you get. All right. So let's take a look at what actually comes out of this. Now I have three input channels, which is why I set this thing up for a gain of three. So it'll perfectly compensate. I've got one volt peak for each of the inputs, but I've separated them out in frequency so we can see them, right? Low frequency, 100 hertz, middle frequency, one kilohertz, high frequency, 10 kilohertz. Now, since they're all one volt and they're all going to get this same divider of one third, right? We would expect one third of a volt for each, but the gain of the amplifier is three. So three times a third gets us one volt. So I should see all three of these signals sum together at V load. And we can see that very nicely with a transient analysis. So I'm going to spread this out so I can see, you know, from 10 to 20, um, we can see all three of these. Some of them are going to be really tight and some of them are just going to be like one cycle, right? The 100 hertz is just going to be one cycle. But these other ones are going to see a lot more. Okie doke. Now, this is looking a little messy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spread out the uh, individual plots here. We're going to separate these. So you can see, all right, here's VN number one, right? This is the one, the one kilohertz. VN number two, that's the 10 kilohertz. You can see how fast that's going. And then VN number three is the 100 hertz, right? Just one cycle of that. And over here is V load, the combination of the three. So it may not be immediately apparent, but if you look at this carefully, you realize this is literally the summation of these three things. And notice, by the way, this amplitude is three peak, right? Plus and minus three volts versus one volt for the other three. So really, if you want to scale this, this is three times any of these amplitudes. So here's the way you look at this, right? Here's the low frequency. Here's the 100 hertz, one big, slow sort of change. And that's what the outline of this is doing, right? You can see how it's kind of high over here, right? It's just touching three volts up here. Down here, it's a bit lower. And then it sort of drops off just like this is dropping off until it gets to a, a, a minimum value down here, which is what we're seeing right there. And then it starts to come back up again, all right? So that tendency is the 100 hertz. Obviously, the little squiggles inside, well, that's this. That's VN2, the 10 kilohertz. And finally, VN1, the 1 kilohertz, is this change right here, right? That sort of secondary outline. That's pretty obvious. Now, if you look right around here in time, okay, right around there, what we see is this is at 1 volt. There's a peak over here that's at 1 volt. And this peak right here is just about 1 volt. So it's 1, 1, 1, which would be 3 volts. And bingo, there you go. We got one of those that's just touching 3 volts. And a similar kind of thing happens over here at the negative, right? So there's your negative 1. There's a peak down here that's about negative 1. And this is just about negative 1. And if we come down here, sure enough, there's a, a peak at around negative 3. So this really is summing up very nicely the three input signals. All right, what about the, uh, the gain bandwidth, you know, the F2 for this thing? Well, we're going to go over here and look at this version of the circuit. So what I've got is just one input. And you can sort of play around with this and look at other inputs, but this will show how the uh, gain bandwidth is being sort of adjusted by the noise gain. So in this thing, the noise gain, like I said, is three. A TL071 uh, is about a three and a half megahertz device. So you divide that by uh, the noise gain of three, and we're looking at a bandwidth of a little over a megahertz. So we can come up here and do an AC analysis and see what we get. And I'll just get out a cursor here. So here's our zero, virtually zero. I mean, minus 84 micro is zero dB for all practical intents and purposes. And we'll come over here and find the minus three. So that's coming in at a little over 1.1 megahertz. So that's exactly where we should be, all right? Now, you don't have to, you don't have to set this gain 
to perfectly match what the loss is. You could set this thing for a gain of one if you wanted to, and you get the full bandwidth out of here. That's something that you don't really have the option to do with the old inverting summer. You get what you get, right? So at least over here, you know, with with uh, you know this kind of thing, where we're only looking at the one input, um, you're going to get whatever the uh, uh, F2 is calculated based on this. All right, so like I said, you could set it up so they match. So this forward gain of three perfectly compensates for that division, but you don't have to. As a matter of fact, there are many cases where you wouldn't want to do that. You know, if you have all of these signals, you've got 16 signals, think about this. If they're one volt apiece, you could end up with the same kind of situation that we had a moment ago you could have uh, situations where, you know, they all happen to be perfectly at the same peak, you know, for one little instant in time. And guess what? One volt each for 16 channels. That's 16 volts. Bingo, you got clipping. All right. So you may not want to do that. You may not want to have that. Sometimes you might, but you may not want to. All right. You could just have a simple buffer arrangement for that and it would work fine. And you get full bandwidth for every single channel. So you definitely have more flexibility here. Um, than you do with the uh, the original uh, inverting summer, okay? So this works out to be a pretty nice circuit. It, it has a little bit more flexibility. Like I said, it's a little easier to sort of expand this. Now you might say, well, you know, what if I want, um, you know, some individual gains, you know, think of like a, a microphone mixer, that kind of thing. What would I do? Maybe I want a really high input impedance. I'm not gonna get that necessarily. Um, you know, unless I use like crazy large resistors, which are going to, is going to negatively impact the noise performance. Well, we can replace each one of these, each one of these input points with, you know, a little buffer or a little gain amplifier, right? If it was a microphone mixer, um, you know, we could use a little series parallel kind of thing like this and then just have a pot hanging off of it to get your individual volume fader for that channel, right? And then feed it into a resistor like this. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, a higher level, uh, like a pro kind of mi a mic mixer where you're using an XLR input, balanced inputs, well, then you'd have some kind of a differential amplifier as a buffer, right? And we've looked at those in other videos. So, um, again, depending on how far you want to go with this, you know, this can grow considerably, but this is a nice heart, if you will, that core piece of the summing amplifier. Right, so a non-inverting sum, summing amplifier. And again, to reiterate, the big advantage here is you have some control over that noise gain. All right. Okay. Take care. See you next time.